Each August, the Elvis Presley Fan Club takes several hundred of its members on a superb memorial tour to the USA. The tour always includes a visit to Memphis, Tennessee, and to the much smaller rural city of Tupelo, Mississippi, where Elvis Aaron Presley was born. Tupelo, the seat of Lee County, lies 104 miles southeast of Memphis. Two railroads pass through the city, the Illinois Central and Gulf Railroad and the Burlington Northern Railroad. The once poor region is today a thriving community with prospering industry, but the people still retain their southern hospitality and visitors are assured of a warm welcome. So come aboard for this special Elvis tour. Elvis's birthplace, the humble dwelling that's become Tupelo's greatest tourist attraction. The two-room wooden house on Old Saltillo Road in East Tupelo was built in 1934 by Vernon Presley, his father, and his brother, Vesta. Vernon was 17 when he married Gladys Smith in 1933. Gladys was four years older and lived in nearby Berry Street. When Gladys found she was pregnant in the summer of 1934, Vernon asked his employer, Orville S. Bean, for a loan to buy timber to build a house. Bean, a dairy farmer, then rented the house to Vernon. On January the 8th, 1935, Gladys Presley knew her time had come. A baby boy was born at 4.05 a.m., but was stillborn. 30 minutes later, a second child was safely delivered by Dr. William Hunt. He was named Elvis Aaron, and he was destined one day to become the most famous entertainer in the world. The stillborn twin, named Jesse Garron, in the local fashion of rhyming names, was buried next day in Priceville Cemetery, about a mile to the east. The Presleys lived in their modest home during the first years of Elvis's life. They had to live hand in hand with poverty, plus the harsh extremes of the Mississippi weather. But one thing they had plenty of was love, love of each other and love of God. The humble little birthplace is a culture shock, especially after seeing the splendor of Elvis's Graceland mansion in Memphis. There were no luxuries like air conditioning and indoor plumbing. Life in such a dwelling in the depression hit 1930s can't have been easy. The birthplace was restored by the ladies of the East Heights Garden Club in the early 1970s and was open to the public on the 1st of June 1971. The furnishings aren't the original of course but are similar to what the Presleys would have had. After Elvis died, his birthplace was designated as a Mississippi State Historic Monument. Extensive landscaping of the surrounding area was carried out. The old Saltillo Road became Elvis Presley Drive, and the area around the birthplace is now known as Presley Heights. Fans come from all over the world to visit the tiny house where the King of Rock and Roll was born. The people of Tupelo are true purveyors of southern hospitality, and that goes for the friendly motorcycle policemen too. They provide a royal escort for the coachloads of British fans who arrive each August, and with the chief of police leading the way, they escort the convoy from the outskirts of the city, around the places associated with Elvis, and to the birthplace. They seem to enjoy themselves as much as the fans. The Brits, plus a fair number of fans from many European countries, have been coming to Tupelo since 1972. The official Elvis Presley Fan Club of Great Britain made their first visit to Tupelo in late August 1972, during their first visit to the USA. They saw Elvis's birthplace, his palatial Memphis home, and finally the king himself in Las Vegas. The welcome from the Tupeloans, like the weather, was very warm. The club's made annual visits ever since, the visits nowadays being part of their memorial tours to the USA, and there's always a genuine, friendly welcome, along with a moving memorial service, for the folks in Tupelo are proud that Elvis's roots are in their fine city. There's a nominal charge of a dollar to go through the birthplace, and the money helps with the upkeep of the house. After Elvis became famous, he gave benefit concerts to raise funds to build a youth centre for underprivileged children in the area surrounding the birthplace, 
to be known as Elvis Presley Park. It was a project close to his heart and he visited the park in the early 1960s. There's a swimming pool, clubhouse and other facilities for the neighbourhood kids. The Elvis Presley Memorial Chapel now stands on a rise near to the birthplace. Elvis attended Lawhorn Elementary School from 1941 to 1946. Back in those days, it was known as East Tupelo Consolidated School. When he was 10 in 1945 and in the fifth grade, his teacher, Mrs J.C. Grimes, asked if anyone could say a prayer at assembly. It was in this very auditorium, which probably hasn't changed very much since Elvis's day, that a day or two later, young Elvis came forward and sweetly sang Old Shep, such a sad song about a boy and his dog that it made Mrs Grimes cry. She told the principal, Mr J.D. Cole, and he decided to enter Elvis into the talent contest at the forthcoming Mississippi-Alabama State Fair and Dairy Show in Tupelo. After he became famous, Elvis paid at least one visit back to his old school and his old teacher. In September 1946, Elvis started in the sixth grade at Milam Junior High School. His family had moved from East Tupelo into the area of Tupelo known as Shake Rag. It was around this time that he got his first guitar. He used to take it to school with him and play for anyone who'd listen. One time he sang with a band at a school dance. In 1948, the Presleys made plans to move to Memphis, Tennessee. On his last day at school, his teacher let Elvis sing Leaf on a Tree before saying goodbye to his classmates. This is the marker placed close to Elvis's birthplace by the Mississippi State Historical Commission. It was unveiled on the 8th of January 1978. It's a favourite place for fans to have their photograph taken. You'll recognise the handsome features of Rick Nelson. He visited the birthplace during the British club stay in Tupelo in August 1984 and mingled with the fans. Rick, or Ricky as he was known back then, had many hits in the late 50s and early 60s. Great songs like Hello Mary Lou, Believe What You Say, My Bucket's Got a Hole in It, and It's Late. Playing a mean guitar on all of these rock classics was the legendary James Burton, who of course joined Elvis's band in 1969. Rick, still a popular and likeable figure in the mid-80s, obligingly gave autographs to the Elvis fans during his walkabout in Elvis Presley Park. Elvis and Rick knew and respected each other back in the early days, and Elvis paid Nelson the compliment of including one of his rock standards, My Babe, in his concerts when he began performing again in Las Vegas in 1969. The reason for Rick's visit to Tupelo was to perform in a benefit concert at the Ramada Inn Convention Center, together with his group, the Stone Canyon Band. You may recall their 1970s hit, Garden Party. Sadly, this great talent was lost to the entertainment world less than 18 months later. Rick Nelson died in a plane crash on New Year's Eve 1985, whilst on his way to Dallas. This is the familiar face of Joan Deary, a regular visitor to Tupelo. She still continues to visit, although no longer working for RCA. Another visitor to Tupelo in August 1984 needs no introduction. Friday the 10th of August was proclaimed as Colonel Tom Parker Day. Mrs Janelle McComb, one of Tupelo's best-known citizens, seen here with the Colonel, knew him back before he ever became Elvis's manager. Ms McComb knew the Presley family well, too, and was the force behind Tupelo's Elvis Presley Chapel of Inspiration. During the banquet at the Hilton on the 10th of August, Elvis Presley travel service boss David Wade, in Todd Slaughter's absence, made a presentation to the Colonel of a fine English crystal decanter and put on record the British club's appreciation of all he'd done in promoting Elvis. Colonel Parker, plus his minders, met the fans and gave autographs at a walkabout in Elvis Presley Park during the weekend following the banquet.
the fading facade and the peeling paint of the old Lyric Theatre in Tupelo. The place has obviously seen better days. These yellowing newspaper pictures show graphically the devastation of the tornado that hit Tupelo in 1936. In just 32 seconds, 216 people were killed, over 1,000 injured and 900 homes destroyed. Mercifully, the Presley's home in East Tupelo was spared. Following the disaster, a sermon was given at the Lyric Theatre asking if God sent the tornado. This must have been a question that the God-fearing people of Tupelo asked themselves many times. Tupelo's fine courthouse has a cupola that is one of the best-known landmarks in the city. The entrance is equally as imposing. The story goes that while Elvis was attending Milam Junior High School, he'd go and sit under the shady magnolia trees at the courthouse and play his guitar and sing. The Tupelo Hardware Store on West Main Street is where Elvis bought his first guitar. It was probably in January of 1946, when Elvis celebrated his 11th birthday, that Gladys took him to the store to choose a gift. He wanted a bicycle, but his overprotective mother wasn't keen, especially when she saw the $55 price tag. She asked if Elvis wouldn't rather have a guitar, since that was much cheaper, just $12.95. Elvis reluctantly agreed if he could have the bike later on. The salesman at Tupelo Hardware, Mr Forrest Bobo, sold Elvis the guitar. He eventually got his coveted bike at Christmas 1947. Elvis and his guitar became inseparable. He was taught chords by his pastor, the Reverend Frank Smith, and his uncles, Vesta Presley and Johnny Smith. Even at that early age, his musical influences were being formed by the country music he heard on the radio and the spiritual music he heard in the First Assembly of God Church. Elvis never learned to read music, but despite what some people say, he did learn to play the guitar. These are the old hog pens and cattle sheds at the Tupelo Fairgrounds. The Mississippi-Alabama Fair and Dairy Show is held in Tupelo each autumn. In October 1945, when he was 10, Elvis was entered by his school principal in the Children's Day Talent Contest. He stood on a chair to reach the microphone and sang Old Shep unaccompanied. He won second prize, five dollars and free admission to all the rides and attractions. After he became famous, Elvis returned to Tupelo to give several benefit performances at the fairgrounds. The return of their local hero was a big occasion for tiny Tupelo. Excitement had been growing for weeks. 26th of September 1956 was declared Elvis Presley Day, with a street parade preceding two blockbuster concerts on a stage erected in front of these grandstands. Fans came from far and near to watch Elvis, wearing a blue velvet shirt and white buck shoes, deliver songs like Don't Be Cruel, Heartbreak Hotel, Love Me Tender and Hound Dog in the style that had recently earned him the title King of Rock and Roll. Elvis donated his $10,000 fee to the Elvis Presley Youth Centre project in Tupelo. He was given the key to the city by the governor of Mississippi. Plenty of film footage of the afternoon show exists, and in 1984, RCA released the concerts on Elvis, a Golden Celebration. Imagine these stands being filled with screaming, swooning teenagers and Elvis grinning, rocking and shaking a leg. The King returned to the fairgrounds a year later, on the 27th of September 1957, creating more hysteria. The 11th of August 1987, and the 1100 or so fans on the 10th anniversary memorial tour gathered for a class of 87 group photo at the fairgrounds. You see, I don't understand y'all any better than y'all understand me. <laughs> Fans from all over the UK and most European countries sat on the hard, hot, wooden bleachers of one of the grandstands. Our revered leader, Mr Todd Slaughter, was dressed appropriately for the occasion in a headmaster's cap and gown, to the amusement of all. It took quite a while to get everyone seated and ready, and by the time the photos were eventually taken by two men on a towering crane, everyone was melting in temperatures of around 100 degrees, 
and praying for a cloud to obscure the sun. With the strong midday sun burning the pale skin of the fans, who'd only arrived in Tupelo from London two nights before, and the high humidity causing clothing to stick to bodies, everybody was glad to escape to the air-conditioned coolness of the Tupelo Mall, or to visit the Elvis-themed McDonald's and relax and sip a long, cold drink. The previous day, the 10th of August, was Fan Appreciation Day in Tupelo, and the Elvis Country Fan Club had unveiled a plaque detailing Elvis's appearances at the fairground. The intense heat caused problems. This unfortunate young lady succumbed to heat stroke. Like everyone else, she appreciated the air-conditioned comfort of Continental Trailway's huge buses. There were around 20 coaches in the 1987 convoy, and banners proclaiming Elvis Presley Fan Club on tour were displayed, just in case anyone didn't know what this mammoth convoy represented. A sign denoting Elvis Presley Grandstand was also unveiled on the 10th of August 1987. Liberty Land, the theme park in Memphis that Elvis loved to visit. And this is the Zippin Pippin, the white knuckle roller coaster that was one of Elvis's favorite rides. He loved the fairgrounds and many times rented them from midnight until dawn in the 1960s and 70s at a cost of $17,000. He'd invite family and friends, plus any fans who happened to be around, to go along too. Originally called the Mid-South Fairgrounds, the name was changed to Liberty Land in 1976 to coincide with the American Bicentennial. Once he got on the Zippin Pippin, Elvis was loath to get off, as many fans, and their stomachs, found to their cost. He'd ride non-stop on the giant roller coaster up to 20 times in a row, either in the front or rear car, and he liked to stand up as the ride rose and dipped. It was undoubtedly a foolhardy thing to do, and nail-biting for any spectators. But that was Elvis, living up to his nickname, Crazy. His other favourite ride was the Fender Bender bumper cars. Again, he'd ride for hours on end, bumping off all opposition with a great big grin on his face. Elvis loved to win, and he usually did. He made sure that everyone had a good time, encouraging them to join in the fun rather than stand on the sidelines. It was free popcorn and Pepsis, or whatever else they fancied. Elvis was still a child at heart, living out his boyhood fantasies. The last time that Elvis visited Liberty Land was on the 8th of August, 1977, when he took his nine-year-old daughter, Lisa Marie, and her friends for a night of fun and thrills. Each August, there's an Elvis tribute at Liberty Land with singer Andy Childs. Elvis appeared in his first big show, a country jamboree headlined by Slim Whitman, at Memphis's Overton Park Shell Auditorium on the 30th of July 1954. He was billed as Ellis Presley, and he was so nervous that his legs were shaking. The start of the famous Presley gyrations, perhaps. This is the former premises of Crown Electric Company on Poplar Avenue. Elvis worked there in 1954, driving a pickup truck and studying to be an electrician at night school. 706 Union Avenue, the legendary Sun Recording Studio. In 1985, a Tennessee State Historical Marker was unveiled by owner Sam Phillips. The studio has been carefully restored to give it atmosphere and an authentic feel of what it must have been like in the mid-50s when Elvis made his first recordings here. Today, Graceland operates tours of the studio. At the control panel in Sun's sound booth is Sam Phillips, the foresighted genius who signed Elvis. This picture dates from around the time he first recorded Elvis. 
Gladys Presley bestows a kiss on her son at a gathering at Sun's studio. The photo shows Bob Neal, Elvis's manager at the time, an RCA attorney, Vernon Presley, Elvis, Gladys and Colonel Tom Parker. Sam Phillips, the RCA attorney, and Elvis pose here. Elvis first visited Sun's subsidiary, the Memphis Recording Service, in the summer of 1953 to make a private recording of My Happiness. A year later, Sam Phillips contacted him, put him in touch with guitarist Scotty Moore and bassist Bill Black, and the result of their first recording session was That's All Right, Mama, and Blue Moon of Kentucky, a totally original sound. Four more singles followed, plus other tracks that weren't released until after Elvis signed with RCA in November 1955. All this heavy equipment looks so antiquated now, especially this outsized old microphone, but what a brilliant pure sound Sam achieved. The Elvis tracks still sound as fresh today as when they were cut some 35 years ago. Elvis revisited Sun in December 1956 when the famous Million Dollar Quartet session took place with other Sun artists Carl Perkins, Johnny Cash and Jerry Lee Lewis joining Elvis to sing mostly gospel songs. Huge blow-up pictures of Elvis adorn the walls of Sun Studio today. You hear the Elvis story told and listen to some of the innovative tracks he cut here when you take a tour of the studio. The studio is still in use today. You too have recorded here. What a depressing sight, but one all too familiar in the USA. These old automobiles lie rusting in the yard adjoining American Sound Studio. It's hard to believe that in 1969 Elvis cut brilliant tracks like Suspicious Minds and In the Ghetto in this dilapidated place. The studio, demolished in July 89, was in an unsafe, run-down area of Memphis. On Beale Street is Lansky's famous men's outfitters store. Clothiers to the King, they call themselves. The sign mentions the rare photos of Elvis that are displayed in the store. Lansky's famous Memphis mural. This photo dates from about 1962 and shows Elvis trying on an outfit attended by Mr Lansky, who knew him well. Lansky's cater mainly for big and tall men and is one of Memphis's best-known shops. As a teenager, Elvis used to window shop here, and after he became famous, he bought many of his colourful clothes from Lansky's, becoming their best-known customer. A genuine Elvis autograph, given by the King to Bernard Lansky, and no doubt much prized today. In an area north of downtown Memphis, at 185 Winchester Street, are the Lauderdale Courts, a low-income public assistance housing project. The Presleys moved into Lauderdale Courts in 1949, after leaving the slum-like one-room apartment in a shabby rooming house on Poplar Avenue, which had been their first Memphis home. Fifties Elvis, outside Lauderdale Courts, in his ROTC uniform. Nowadays, this part of Memphis is a poverty-stricken black area, and it's not a safe place to venture on your own. Many taxi drivers won't even go into the area. The fan club's coach tour is probably the best way to get a glimpse of Lauderdale Courts. Elvis's family were allocated a ground floor apartment with two bedrooms and paid $35 a month rent in line with their low income. Elvis's grandmother, Minnie Mae Presley, came from Tupelo to live with them. Elvis lived at Lauderdale Courts during the greater part of his school days in Memphis. Humes High School is not too far away from here. Although it was undoubtedly a step up from their previous squalid apartment, Life at the courts was no bowl of cherries. The apartments, built by the federal government in the mid-1930s, were best described as adequate, 
with few home comforts. Little spare cash was available to buy the things that make a house into a home. Ceiling fans provided some relief from the intense summer heat and humidity. The plumbing was pretty basic. Elvis was able to have more of the freedom that a teenager needs, but there was little he could do about the seedy area he lived in. It's to his credit that he managed to keep out of the trouble that he might have got into by living in such an area. In November 1952, with Vernon working at United Paint and Gladys working as a nurse's aide at St Joseph's Hospital, their combined income took them over the limit allowed. They were given notice to quit and moved out on the 7th of January 1953. The Playhouse may be a name unfamiliar to Elvis fans, but this theatre used to be known as the Memphian. It was one of the cinemas that Elvis used to rent out for his midnight movie shows. He'd invite fans and friends and show both first-run Hollywood features and his old favourite films. The fans who attended the midnight movies in the 1960s and 1970s said that Elvis used to enjoy himself immensely. Sometimes he'd answer back the actors on screen. And if he didn't like a film, he'd have them take it off halfway through and put the next one on. He'd watch old favourites like Patton with George C. Scott and Dr. Strangelove with Peter Sellers over and over. He thought Sellers was the funniest person ever. He rarely showed his own films. There'd be popcorn, candy and soft drinks available. Some of the seats had name plaques on the armrests. This one's for Marion Keiska, the receptionist at Sun Studio, and right next to it is Elvis's personal seat. He always sat in the same seat. Everyone else had to sit behind him, otherwise they'd be turning around to look at him all the time. The movie shows usually lasted until dawn, then Elvis headed back home to Graceland. He used this side exit, down in the alley, when he left the theatre. The Hollywood style premiere of This Is Elvis was held at the Memphian on April the 3rd, 1981, and a few years later the name was changed to The Playhouse. From Memphis to Hollywood. This huge sign on the hillside above Hollywood Boulevard is one of the film capital's best-known landmarks. Elvis's first movie in 1956 was Love Me Tender. He made 31 scripted movies in all, the final one being Change of Habit in 1969. Many of his films were lightweight musicals, and his best acting performance and his own personal favourite film was King Creole in 1958. This is Bel Air, a select area in the Hollywood Hills with numerous luxurious and elegant homes of movie stars and other rich and famous people. Bellagio Road is a long and winding road just north of the Sunset Strip and close to the exclusive Bel Air Country Club. Elvis rented a large Mediterranean style house at 1059 Bellagio Road around the beginning of 1962, whilst he was still in Hollywood finishing work on Kid Galahad. The house had a red tiled roof, curved white walls, balconies, shutters at the windows and was up a long driveway. It was shielded from the roadway and the ever-present fans by hedges and thick shrubbery. Another star who has a home in this area is Tom Jones, whose house is in the background on the left. The first house that Elvis ever bought in California was at 1174 Hillcrest Road in the exclusive Truesdale Estates area of Beverly Hills, 
It cost him $400,000. He and Priscilla moved in a few months after they were married. The house is multi-leveled in French Regency style with a guest house and pool and sits on the topmost slope of a mountain overlooking Los Angeles. There are many photos of Elvis taken in the driveway or at the gates of this house, showing him with fans like Sue Weigert. These are more of the lovely homes along Bellagio Road. The house that Elvis lived in had a huge marble entrance hall, a mirrored master bedroom, a bowling alley in the cellar, and a downstairs den with a movie projector and a screen hidden by curtains. Elvis's pet chimpanzee, Scatter, once swung on the curtains and went right through the screen. Elvis only lived at the Bellagio Road address for six months. He thought that it was too much like a mausoleum and he kept getting lost in it. Rocker Place in Bel Air is located high in the hills just off the Stone Canyon Road. Elvis rented a house here in late 65 or early 66. He was living here at the time of his marriage in May 1967. In those days the house looked vastly different than it does today. Then it was a low, one-storey, rather plain modern ranch style house nestling in scrubby mountainside. On one side of the house was a large patio and swimming pool. The pool area hasn't changed a great deal. The stone urns that Elvis had painted an electric blue are still here, but are back to their original natural colour. The house has now been remodelled into a two-storey English Tudor-style home, and a cantilevered tennis court has been built out on the mountainside. The shrubbery round the house has grown extensively, and ivy covers the fence that fans once used to hang over. In fact, lack of privacy was the reason Elvis moved. There was a mountain road up above the house where fans and others would gather with binoculars and telephoto lenses, and Elvis couldn't use the pool or patio. And naturally, after he and Priscilla were married, they needed even more privacy. Perugia Way in Bel Air, which crosses Bellagio Road, is where Elvis rented his first Hollywood home in late 1960. He'd stayed in a suite at the Beverly Wilshire Hotel up until then. Elvis and his friends lived at Perugia Way until late 1965. It was ideal since it was built in a semicircle and everyone had their own room. Elvis moved out in 1962 to the Bellagio Road house, then six months later moved back. The house had pinball machines, pool table, jukebox and several TVs. The back of the house and the pool area overlook the golf course at the Bel Air Country Club. There are stories of Elvis and his friends buying BB guns, throwing flash bulbs into the pool and shooting at them. And one time Elvis rode his Harley Davidson into the living room his co-star in Viva Las Vegas, Anne Margaret, used to visit Elvis here in 1963. And this is the house where, in August 1965, the famous meeting took place between Elvis and the Beatles. Elvis often let his fans visit and share in the evening's fun, which usually amounted to watching television, shooting pool, listening to records, or just chatting. There were always soft drinks, pizzas and hamburgers available. The neighbours didn't like all the fans hanging around, or Scatter, or Elvis and his friends all riding their motorbikes, and often called the police. A feature of the house is the atrium, or garden, in the centre. When Elvis lived here, he put in a second den, and instead of the waterfall, he built a circular fireplace in which there'd be a fire on cool evenings. There was pale tangerine carpeting and comfortable curved off-white settees with lots of cushions. The living room had a secret entrance. The walls would open 
and Elvis would suddenly appear. Elvis spent Christmas 1961 here. This rare film of the Perugia Way house has a special significance. In 1988, the house was demolished to make way for a huge mansion. The azure skies and tall palms along Sunset Boulevard and the lovely climate of Southern California are very appealing. But Elvis was always glad to wrap up a movie and head back to Memphis and the seclusion of Graceland. He wasn't part of the Hollywood crowd and didn't like the parties and premieres that are so much a part of Tinseltown. One of Hollywood Boulevard's attractions honors stars of movies, TV and records. Elvis's star is set in the sidewalk near Mann's Chinese Theatre, where the star's handprints in cement can be seen. Elvis's star marks his achievements in the recording field, and everyone makes a beeline for it whenever the fan club tours Hollywood. Two Swords has a wax museum in Hollywood. Their Elvis model is very lifelike, with a beautiful jumpsuit, far better than London's effort. So, it's goodbye to Hollywood, and we head east, to Nashville. This is RCA's famous Studio B. Elvis first recorded here on the 20th of March, 1960, on his return from his army service. Elvis first went to Nashville to record in January 1956, after signing with RCA. His first million seller, Heartbreak Hotel, cut on the 10th of January 1956, was recorded at the old studios on McGavock Street. He used Studio B from March 1960 onwards. Over 20 sessions here produced many gold discs. Amongst the Nashville million sellers were It's Now or Never, Are You Lonesome Tonight, Devil in Disguise, I've Lost You, Surrender, His Latest Flame and Good Luck Charm. Some of his finest work on the religious albums His Hand in Mine and How Great Thou Art was recorded here, plus seasonal music and outstanding album tracks like Reconsider Baby, I Met Her Today, Tomorrow's a Long Time, Stranger in the Crowd and I'll Remember You. The Nashville sound, justifiably famous, with the excellence of studio musicians like Floyd Kramer, Hank Garland, Boots Randolph, Charlie McCoy, and of course the Jordanaires. Elvis's producers were Bill Porter and Felton Jarvis. And he often warmed up with gospel jams and liked to get the right atmosphere. For instance, he had a decorated tree in the studio whilst cutting Christmas songs and had the lights turned off while singing the girl of my best friend. He last recorded at Studio B in June 1971. Today, the studio is a tourist attraction. These gold-plated discs are part of the customised interior decor of a unique vehicle, Elvis's gold Cadillac limousine on display at Nashville's Country Music Hall of Fame. The car, a 1960 Cadillac Fleetwood Series 75, was personalised by Hollywood's King of the Custom, George Barris, at his custom shop in Van Nuys, California. The interior of the car is the ultimate in luxury and opulence. The gold-plated fittings include a refrigerator, a shoe buffer, an entertainment console with RCA record player and swivel TV, a tape deck, a vanity case with gold electric razor and hair clipper, and a dual gold flake telephone set into the rear seat armrest. Gold lame curtains cover the windows and the rear seats designed for comfort. A guitar-shaped plaque carries Elvis's engraved signature.
The Cadillac is painted with 40 coats of a paint made from crushed diamonds and oriental fish scales, giving a highly polished translucent pearl effect. Headlight rims, front grille, wheel covers and hubcaps are all 24 karat gold plated. This magnificent car cost $100,000 and it's a vehicle fit for a king. Elvis drove it occasionally in the early 60s, but it was used mainly by RCA in the mid 60s in various promotions for Elvis's records. It also went on tour to Australia and other places, but never came to Britain. Memphis's beautiful Hernando de Soto Bridge was built in the early 70s. The house in Alabama Street, where Elvis lived in the early 50s, was demolished to make way for the Interstate 40 Expressway and the bridge. An aerial view of downtown Memphis's skyline and Main Street, which is now the pedestrianised Mid-America Mall. We're back in Beale Street at Elvis Presley Plaza, a memorial park opposite Lansky's. Memphis's impressive Elvis statue stands in the centre of the plaza. It was sculpted by Eric Parks of Philadelphia and modelled on the head of a Greek statue. Commissioned by the Memphis Development Foundation, the nine and a half foot tall bronze statue was unveiled on the 14th of August 1980 by the mayor of Memphis, Wyeth Chandler. The unveiling was filmed for the David Frost documentary Elvis, he touched their lives. The statue is acknowledged by many to be the finest of several Elvis statues around the world. Wild in the country, just across the state line from Tennessee and about 15 minutes drive from Graceland, is the 163-acre Circle G Ranch, which Elvis bought in 1967 for $300,000. In 1966, he'd bought a horse for Priscilla, which he'd named Domino, and a beautiful spirited Palomino, the rising sun, for himself, plus another 15 horses for his family and friends. There wasn't enough room at Graceland, so he acquired the rolling ranch at Walls, Mississippi, and moved all the horses there. There were already over a hundred head of Santa Gertrudis cattle on the ranch. Elvis and Priscilla spent part of their honeymoon in a trailer on the ranch in May 1967. In 1968, whilst Elvis and Priscilla were riding at the ranch, she lost a valuable ring and it was never found. There's a large, tranquil lake on the property, spanned by a bridge, under which numerous birds, probably swifts, find safe nesting sites in which to raise their young. An imposing feature on the property is the tall white cross close by the lake, which looks impressive when illuminated at night. Elvis sold the Circle G in 1969 for over $400,000. Since the spring of 1984, a very unusual sight has greeted people travelling along Elvis Presley Boulevard. Elvis's huge and beautiful Corvair 88 jet plane, the Lisa Marie, call sign Hound Dog One, is parked close by the highway almost opposite Graceland. On its tail, it proudly bears Elvis's TCB logo. Elvis bought the jet in 1975, had it refurbished, named it for his daughter, and used it for tours until June 1977. The engines have been removed and the plane's a popular attraction amongst the visitors to Graceland who are allowed to tour through the plane and see its opulent interior. We're looking at the Lisa Marie through Graceland's famous music gates across the multi-lane Elvis Presley Boulevard. The gates, which Elvis had installed in 1957, are electronically operated from the guard hut. How many fans have travelled to Memphis from all over the world and stood outside Graceland's front wall? 
The wall isn't 10 feet high, as some books have said. In several places, it's low enough to look over and gaze up at the house through the trees or at the pillars around the meditation garden. At the north end of the wall, just inside the gates, is the little guard house, once the domain of Elvis's affable Uncle Vesta. Whilst Elvis was alive, there was little or no graffiti to be seen on Graceland's front wall. But since August 1977, many fans have felt compelled to leave messages of love and hope on the wall. When you walk alongside the long fieldstone wall and read these messages, you'll find that they're written and usually signed and dated by fans from every corner of the world and every state of the USA. Many of the messages are very touching and almost all are from the heart. Not every fan writes on the wall, of course. There are many who have some respect for Elvis's property. Outside Graceland's wall, on the evening of the 15th of August every year, thousands of fans gather for a moving candlelight vigil. They light their candles from a torch lit from the eternal flame at Elvis's grave and walk solemnly up to the meditation garden. On their return, many place their candles on top of the front wall. The number of messages on the wall increases greatly each August as many thousands of fans flock into Memphis to pay tribute to the King. Every so often the wall's sandblasted clean, but it doesn't take long for the fans' messages of love to reappear. The Graceland gates swing open. Welcome to Elvis's world and to his beautiful home. Graceland reposes in tranquil beauty. After the White House, Graceland is the most famous home in America and it's been host to over half a million visitors annually since it opened as a museum on the 7th of June 1982. Until Graceland opened to the public, few people had ever seen the back of the house. Elvis's grandmother, Minnie Mae Presley, lived in the East Wing until her death in 1980. Elvis's Aunt Delta lives here now with her little Pomeranian dog, Edmund II. A peaceful view from the paddock. Elvis had 17 horses stabled in Graceland's barn at one time. Now, only one or two of the original animals remain. Elvis's favourite, the much-loved Rising Sun, died in 1986 and lies at rest here in the pasture. In 1988, Graceland acquired a new young Palomino called Sun's Reflection. This famous logo needs little introduction and it adorns a very famous car, the oversized 1955 pink Cadillac that Elvis bought for his mother Gladys, although she didn't drive, and which he couldn't bear to part with after her death in 1958. It was last driven in April 1981 when it took part in the Hollywood style premiere of This Is Elvis at the Memphian Theatre. Since June 1982, the pink Cadillac has been a popular attraction at Graceland and now resides in the new car museum. Elvis loved motorcycles. One of the first things he bought after he became famous in 1956 was a powerful Harley Davidson. This special 1976 bicentennial model is possibly the last Harley Davidson he ever bought. It only has 363 miles on the clock. Elvis loved to put on his motorcycle leathers and helmet and ride around the deserted Memphis streets under cover of darkness. 
Fans often got to meet him and get a photo or autograph when he stopped to fill up at Vickers Service Station, a little way from Graceland. This Harley Davidson, along with the pink Cadillac and his other vehicles, was also put on show in a new museum which opened opposite Graceland in the summer of 89. This is the elegant dining room at Graceland, looking across towards the living room. The living room is comfortably furnished and this is the view across to the dining room as seen from the entrance to the music room with its peacock windows. Sometimes there were a dozen people seated at the oval dining room table with Elvis at its head. The luxurious settee in the living room is 15 feet long and was specially made for Elvis. A portrait of the King in 1957, the year he bought Graceland, hangs in the living room. The decor downstairs at Graceland is very unusual and distinctive. The TV room has a mirrored ceiling and comfortable deep blue settees to relax on. Elvis collected statues of monkeys the house has several of them. He also liked to watch three games of football at the same time. Also in the TV wall is a record player. Elvis had a large collection of albums and singles and they're still there. Gospel albums are probably amongst these discs and albums by his favourites like Mario Lanza. Across the hallway from the TV room is the equally unique pool room. Elvis was a skilled pool player and he installed this table in 1957. And this tear, the tour guides tell you, was made by one of Elvis's friends. Elvis spent countless hours down in the pool room playing against his friends and usually winning. A beautiful Tiffany lamp hangs above the pool table. The room has a very warm and cosy feel to it. Both the walls and the ceiling are covered in a colourful fabric, 750 yards of it. Elvis seems to have been very fond of shells and coral. Maybe he brought them back as souvenirs of his visits to Hawaii. There are many beautiful and interesting objets d'art and pictures displayed in the pool room. The most unique room of all at Graceland is the Jungle Den. It's most fans' favourite room. Elvis found all of the intricately carved furniture with its animal motif in a Memphis showroom and bought the lot. He thought that it created a Hawaiian effect. This oversized chair was his favourite. He loved the Jungle Room. Very rarely seen, since it's not on the regular tours of Graceland, is the large and beautifully equipped kitchen with every modern appliance. There's a staircase that leads directly up to the first floor from the kitchen and Mary Jenkins, or one of the other cooks, would always be on hand to serve up anything that Elvis fancied. Every visitor to Graceland can't help but be fascinated by the trophy room, housed in a large separate building adjoining the house. The Hall of Gold is unique, and no one can fail to be impressed by row after row of gleaming gold, silver and platinum awards, literally hundreds of them, and new ones are still being added, as Elvis's records continue to sell in great quantities all over the world. His total sales passed a billion several years ago, and nobody else even comes close to that figure, and probably never will. That is why he's called the King. Even the most cynical tourist, the sort of person who will readily criticise Elvis's taste in decor inside the Graceland mansion, can only gaze in awe at this display. It says it all. The awards on display are not only from the USA, of course. They're from all over the world, 
Japan, France, West Germany, Norway, Britain, Canada, Holland, Sweden, Australia, the list goes on. This special quintuple award was given to Elvis for five million sales of Don't Be Cruel. The disc was released in 1956 with another classic, Hound Dog, on the other side. Elvis's biggest selling single was It's Now or Never in 1960. There are awards from many countries in the Hall of Gold for this disc, including one from Great Britain. It sold a million in six and a half weeks, topped the charts for nine weeks, and gave Elvis his first British gold disc. In 1968, Elvis made his television comeback in a memorable special, and the black leather suit he wore still evokes great emotion. Earthy, streetwise, and very, very sexy. On this rack of jumpsuits are the blue Tiffany suit from 1972 and the caped fringed white suit from 1970. This of course is the fringed beaded jumpsuit from That's the Way It Is. The Memphis 74 suit. Sneakers, slippers, boots and the blue and white shoes that Elvis wore in the Steve Allen show in 1956. More fancy boots. This very ornate suit was worn in Las Vegas in August and September 1973 and when Elvis was recorded live at the Mid-South Coliseum on the 20th of March 1974, he wore it. Not surprisingly, it's known as the Memphis 74 suit. It's covered in multicoloured stones and gold studs and it looked truly sensational on the King. the red flower suit, a rare black suit from 1973, the ornately embroidered gypsy alpine suit from 1975, and 74's dragon suit are amongst more of Elvis's colourful stage wear on show in the main hall of the trophy room. These close-ups of the jumpsuit legs show how intricate the stone and stud settings were and the fine embroidery. And right at the end is the tiger suit, Elvis's pride as an American was displayed to the world in this suit from Aloha from Hawaii with its red, white and blue eagle motif. Surely the most famous suit in the world, worn by the most famous American in the world, Elvis. Elvis. Memphis is a very beautiful city. We've always had a lot of flowers and a lot of trees, some of which we're losing in the expansion. And it's always had excellent cultural advantages, which were very important to me growing up in the Depression years and to my sisters. I don't know how I can have been so lucky to have had the opportunities that I had as a child. I grew up being very active all my life in, in theatrical and broadcasting work. I've been in broadcasting since 1929 when I was part of a children's story hour on one of the local stations. I was born in Memphis, Tennessee, where I still live and where I have lived most of the intervening years except for the brief period when I was away in the Air Force. Uh, I like to show off my new t-shirt, Memphis slogan being, start something great in Memphis. And I took the liberty of adding a few letters and words so that my t-shirt says, my parents started something great in Memphis. <laughs> I had played in the high school band, uh, Coffee High School Band in Florence, Alabama, the Muscle Shoals area. 
northwest Alabama, not too, about 150 miles from Memphis. I had dealt with many, many black people and country musicians, all amateurish, and um, it had made a, a great impression on me. I also grew up on the Grand Ole Opry, which was in Nashville, of course, and uh, some hundred miles and heard it from WSM in Nashville on Saturday nights. And I had a confluence of, uh, of uh, once a month uh, dances and stuff. My older sisters, I've won, I'm one of uh, eight children, the youngest of eight. So once a month we would go and uh, uh, throw out everything in the living room and uh, that, was, uh, that was the dance floor. And the amateur people that worked by day would come and this one would play the fiddle, this one would play the mandolin guitar. And this one that couldn't sing would sing very well for the, for the dance. All of these things influenced me a lot. As a matter of fact, after high school and college, I graduate and I'm thinking, well, here I am, world. <laughs> what do I know how to do? And it turns out I really didn't know anything practical. I did try to go to, I did try to go to secretarial school, but I think they gave up on me about the time I gave up. I did work briefly as a secretary, but it, and I took shorthand, but it took a lot longer than just writing longhand, so that didn't work either. But the thing is, the background that I had, the general knowledge of so many things, all came together and focused on the area of broadcasting. I was a depression child. And I lost my father at a very young age. I was about 15 years old. I had a deaf-mute aunt who was a very brilliant person and an older mother being the youngest of eight children. So uh, <clears throat> all of these things tended to, uh, when I saw I couldn't go to school and finish my education, my formal curricular education, I couldn't let my mother or anyone know of my disappointment and my ability, inability to go and finish school and get my law degree and I had no desire to be a lawyer for anything other than a criminal defense lawyer and to defend people that wasn't able to pay for the services maybe like some lawyers required back in those days as, uh, and as today too. But those people paid lawyers and people with chickens and with farmland and this sort of thing. Well, all of these things, the only thing I can say really influenced me to say, well, if you can't say what you have in mind <clears throat> this way, there's got to be another way. And I believe in communication. So consequently, my interest became very deeply ingrained in my mind in music. I married and moved away for a year and lived, as I say, sometimes rather crudely, uh, 10 years one winter in Peoria and decided that I had to come back to Memphis. And so I did, I brought my young son back with me and that the marriage ended and I went into the fields I knew, the broadca broadcasting, working for advertising agencies and uh, uh, writing scripts and producing shows and doing a lot of acting, too. And um, I did that until I met... I did that. I was doing that, I should say, at the time that I met Sam Phillips and the whole idea of the recording studio came up, which completely changed my life and a lot of other lives as well. As the time moved on and uh, I was able to make a living in radio, then I, I decided, well, I've got two young kids. We're moving along pretty fast here, but I got two young kids and, uh, and a wife, and I've got a good job, I guess, but it doesn't pay a lot, but somehow or the other, I've got to manage, I've got to manage to get myself an opportunity to try to do what I think I can do with regard to letting humanity express in itself in music. 
Well, Sam was working as an engineer, and I was working, as I say, as a producer, writer. I had my own daily shows, the main one of which was an interview talk show called Meet Kitty Kelly, which was rated one of the most popular shows in the area. It was on the air for 10 years, and there's still people around Memphis who say, hi, Kitty, or call me by that, or think of me in, in terms of that show, which is very gratifying. And uh, Sam and I became better acquainted. He would talk often about wanting to have a recording studio, and uh, he opened it on a shoestring, and I'm a compulsive helper, <laughs> and the first thing I know, I was over there painting floors and washing walls, and I was working, in the end, about 36 hours a day, 10 days a week, most of it at the recording studio, uh, being, as I, the only way I can describe it, assistant everything. Uncle Silas Payne, who was a black man that I grew up with, uh, that I love very much, he was a great philosopher. I was a very skinny kid as a child, very sickly, physically sickly and maybe mentally too, I don't know. But uh, he encouraged me a lot. He'd put his hand on my shoulder and get a hold of my little bony, jaunty shoulder and, and say, Sam, you're going to be great. Sam was able to achieve things with that little second-hand uh, equipment that he had there and by using various devices for echoing and extension and all, some of which were never revealed and some of which were only guessed at. But he definitely had in his hands and in his ears something very, very special. I saw the many different things that uh, took place in the lives, especially of the Southern black man. I saw them sing without instrumentation. The greatest instrument in the world, of course, is the human voice to me. Uh, it doesn't have to be the most beautiful voice in the sense that it's got great range, but uh, if it speaks of something and it gives you a dialogue with yourself and maybe other people, that uh, to me is, uh, is, is something very beautiful. This was the way they had of communicating and invariably to me that caught my attention. The effort throughout was to give each artist a distinct sound, a distinct musical personality. I wasn't a great musician, but I was a great, I had a great ability to get the best out of great musicians, potentially great musicians. When they got to my studio, when I opened it up in 1950, and started to invite them in to audition them, they were, they couldn't believe it because no place in the South to go at that time to even audition. None of them or very few had the money to go to Chicago or certainly to New York or LA. I think obviously the, the artists who came in brought something with them, but first of all, they could not have gotten into any other recording studio in the world, black or white, certainly not the black and probably not the white. Most of them were not even trained musicians. They were working as at garages or as salesmen or in other jobs and practiced playing around with friends at night. And some of them, Sam had to be very adamant about differences of opinion as to what they wanted to record and what he finally recorded. When they came into my studio, there was a great amount of psychology that had to go on to get these things in the essence out of them the essence that it should be. The Memphis Recording Service, which by the way is the only identification that was ever on the exterior of that building at 706 Union, it was always the Memphis Recording Service, which was a general recording service long before the labels came into existence. Uh, the Memphis Recording Service opened, I think, in 1950, I think it was January the 19th, 1950, maybe a few days. And of course, uh, Elvis didn't come onto the scene until 53 and 54, so in the interim, we were doing all sorts of general recording. I brought all my accounts, my commercial accounts that I had formerly been doing at the station, I brought them all to the studio so that we could, could get that money. And of course, I didn't collect any talent for them, so that went into the kitty too. And um, we were doing weddings and funerals and bar mitzvahs and all sorts of remotes uh, to, to make the money to establish the label and to grow. So there were actually two separate enter enterprises. And when I have said that I made Elvis's first record, 
I have never wanted to indicate that I made any of his commercial records, that he was part of the walk-in trade who came in and said, I want to make a record, $3 one side, $4 two, and that is the record that, that I made for him and which led to all the events that followed. The story, the versions of Elvis's first record, of course, vary according to the person telling them. Uh, I have told the same version from the beginning, and at times when I have been at the point of doubting my recollections, because sometimes our memories do alter, uh, my son with the photographic memory has said, Mama, that's the way you came home and told it to me. Bless his heart, if he ever wanted to see Mommy, he had to come over to the studio and see me there, which he was allowed to do infrequently. But one of the nice uh, effects of my son having come over to the studio is that he was present for some of the sessions, some of Elvis's sessions. And he doesn't talk very freely to me about it, but he went to live with an older sister of mine in Ohio in his teen, in his junior high and high school years. And I got some feedback that he used to really wow the kids at assembly, standing up there and telling them Elvis yarns and anecdotes. I wish I'd heard him say that. He's coming to visit me soon. I think I'm going to make him sit down and say, now tell me just exactly what did you tell those kids? But he has, a, he has an almost photographic memory. And even though he was very young at the time, he, he, re he remembers everything about how everybody looked and what they did. He, he particularly enjoyed the sessions, uh, the Elvis sessions, because he was so crazy about Bill Black. Well, Bill was such a comedian. Elvis became aware of me. He heard these black artists. He heard Little Junior Parker, which I had Mystery Train on and Love My Baby. He heard uh, Just Walking in the Rain by Johnny Bragg in the Prison Airs, which was later covered by Johnny Ray on Columbia Records against Sun Records. And, uh, he heard uh, Ike Turner and Jackie Brinston in Rocket 88, which was, has been given up to be the first real, even though it was done by a black man, rock and roll record in the nation. My recollection is that it was a Saturday, that it may or may not have been. The reason I think it was a Saturday because I was there and not rushing off to, to do my daily program at, at WREC. I know that it was, a, it was very, very hot in the studio. There was no air conditioning unit out in the front part of the office. The, air the money for the air conditioners had to go for the studio and for the recording equipment. So it was very, very hot out there. In the earlier accounts of this, there was a little gap of something that I didn't remember. And later Sam's brother Judd reminded me of what had actually happened. And it was that while I was setting up to record the record, Sam Judd and Jim Bullitt, who was Sam's partner at the time, came out of the back of the studio where they'd been having a conference and went through the control room. And I remember turning to Sam and saying, do you want to do this? And he said very abruptly, having his mind on other things, can't you see I'm busy? And went out and they went next door to Miss Taylor's to have a quick cup of coffee. Finally, um, I decided that I, um, would go and make the record myself. So I thought, oh, I want Sam to hear this. Sam's been saying he wanted to find a white man who sounded black, and, and I, I felt that's what was happening here. Actually, something more than that was happening, but that's what I heard, that he sounded black to me. So I looked around wildly for some way, and there was an old paper tape that was lying there, and I, with, while I was still making the record, I reached out with one hand and picked up the tape and put it on and turned it on so that it would record simultaneously. Uh, Marianne came back and said, there is a young man here that uh, wants to make a record for his mother's birthday. And I just happened to be in the mood and he looked like somebody, I don't know why I said yeah that day, because I never said yeah to anybody and the time they wanted to do it, forget it. I mean, I was going to do it on my terms. But there was a psychology going there. I wasn't just being hell, you know, just <laughs> malicious. But uh, somehow or the other, I thought, you know, I I'll listen to this guy. I guess I was finishing. I was out front typing up the label, which I did on paste it on the thing. And um, when Sam came back, I'm not sure whether he... And he went to the back, and I told him I wanted to, to listen to this. I'm not sure whether he, I had left the disc on there while I was waiting to label it, and he may have played part of the disc, or whether he played the tape. Uh, in any case, he did listen to a portion of it. And um, 
he said, uh, well, yeah, he, he, you know, he has potential, but we're too busy. He was 18 years old, uh, and, uh, and I must have been 30. So uh, for him to know all, so many of these different songs, all the way from Hank Snow to, of course, the Ink Spots, the Mills Brothers, uh, Dean Martin, um, uh, let's see, um, oh, God, let's see, Love, the Blackwood Brothers Quartet, which is a Southern Gospel White Quartet. So uh, he found me because of the black records I was cutting at Sun Records. So I wrote down on a little slip of paper, Elvis Presley, good ballad singer, and a telephone number where he could reach, and wrote save on it, and I put it under my desk blotter. I had a suspicion that this, I knew he loved his mother, but I think this was a way to get in and say, look, I will pay you for this. <laughs> you know, he didn't have, somehow or another he felt in his way that he would be compromising his independence uh, by not coming in and saying, can't I pay for it? And he found out that we did at one time do a little personal recording. I recorded funerals, I recorded everything I could, you know, conventions, uh, anything to, to keep the doors open while I auditioned, auditioned these people. So time went by, I don't know how much time, when you're working in those conditions, time doesn't mean anything. You don't know you're making history, you're not making hourly notes, you know. Uh, time went by and I came in from my doing my show and Sam was there and there was a note stuck on the spindle and it said, Elvis Presley had a telephone number, good ballad singer, save. And I said, I went back, I said, did that kid with the sidebirds come in here again? And he said, well, uh, uh, that, that, that fellow's his name, yeah. And even at the time, he didn't seem, Sam didn't seem to have any recollection of the earlier incident, which now he has said really didn't happen. Well, even at the time, he, he didn't remember. So th on this occasion, which I recall as the second occasion that Elvis was in there to make another record, uh, Sam and Elvis were alone in the studio because I was out doing my daily thing at the radio station. Uh, as far as who gets the credit, if you will, or as far as who did what, that's the sequence as I remember it. And actually, the breakthrough for Elvis and for all of those who, the things that happened it was one very rainy Saturday afternoon when just Sam and I were there and Sam decided to tackle a huge stack of demo records that various persons had sent in and immediately I said, what about the kid with the sideburns? <laughs> and Sam said, oh yeah, he might, but I don't, I don't remember his name, I don't know how to get in touch with him. And I said, picking up my blotter. I do. We all in the South, we kind of look up to our elders, so to speak, or to people we respect. And all of that had a lot to do with the achievements that we had with the Perkins, Carl Perkins, Elvis Presley, Roy Orbison, you know, uh, Johnny Cash, all of these Jerry Lee Lewis. Hey, they were no accidents. Somebody had to inspire somebody, and I think together, we had a great inspirational meeting going on every time we had a session. <laughs> well, after listening to Scotty and Bill and Elvis jamming around, jamming around when we were going to leave uh, the studio for that day and come back later, because uh, keep in mind, bearing in mind that we had not gotten what I thought the potential of this young man, we had not captured that on tape yet. Mm -hmm. Heard, that's all right, Mama. Off mic, I was back in the control room doing something else, thinking they were packing up their instruments, but they jamming around. I heard, that's all right, Mama. Walked back into the room and said, hey, why in the hell haven't we done this before? I hadn't heard the record before. I'd heard it by Arthur Crudup, but Elvis had not tried it. He tried it, and I said, let's get on mic and, and let's, let's shoot at this thing a couple of three times, you know? First or the second time, I mean, uh, I forgot which take I took, but uh, it was either first or second take, and it was a toss-up. You could, uh, it, it was so great on mic. That's all right, Mama. That was the thing. After all of the things that we had done, that was the thing that uh, that I uh, had been looking for because I knew that he had it in. Whether it was that's all right, Mama, or something else, it clicked. And believe me, uh, having fooled around with artists and 
making recordings, you know better than anyone when it is quote unquote in that groove. This was there. You could feel it in addition to hearing it. Elvis and I met in high school, at Humes High School, about 1948. He had just moved up from Tupelo, Mississippi. And ironically and coincidentally, we were thrown into the same classes together. We went all the way through high school together in the exact same classes. Uh, we both wanted to be in show business. I wanted to be a disc jockey. Elvis wanted to be an entertainer. After we got out of high school, I went into radio and Elvis started recording. So we became even closer. Elvis dressed differently in high school because he had this desire that he wanted to be in show business. He wanted to be different, so I, I think he felt that if he dressed different and if he looked different, he would stand out in a way that he wasn't trying to be pushy or to cause a scene in the school. He would just look different by his dress and his hair. There was a disc jockey in Memphis named Dewey Phillips, and I was working at a small station in Arkansas, and I came home for the weekend, and I went up to where Dewey was working, and he said, uh, he said, a guy came in last night uh, and I played his first record and I think you know this guy. Well, I didn't know anybody who had records out. So he put the record on the turntable and he held his hand over the label and he played it. He said, who is that singing? I said, I don't know. He said, well, you went to school with him. I said, well, it's got to be Elvis because he was the only guy that could sing in school. And he said, yeah, Sam Phillips brought his record up last night and I interviewed Elvis. We talked about you and everything, being a disc jockey now. And, uh, he, and Elvis told me to, to give you one of his records and play it. So that was the first time I'd heard Elvis' record. Their play was rather easy. Dewey Phillips, no kin to me, even though we have the same last name. He was a disc jockey, very popular, uh, what they call then a race disc jockey. Played rhythm and blues and, uh, and black spiritual songs on red, hot, and blue. That was the title of his program in Memphis, Tennessee on WHBQ radio here. I called Dewey after that and said, Dewey, I want you to come by here and listen to what I've done on Elvis. He knew that we'd been working with Elvis for some time. He said, uh, have you got a dub on it? Bring it down here. It'll be an hour or so before I'm off. Bring it on down here. Let me put it on audition and listen to it and see what I think. I took it on down to him. He listened to it and he literally flipped his lid. I said, well, we're not going to play it tonight, Dewey. I, I, I want to make a better dub. I mean, this was just a quickie. I want to make a better dub. Not that you had any multi-track mixing because it's all monaural, but I said, I want to make a better dub. This is just a quick thing. And he set that thing up. He said, man, we've got a surprise for you people tomorrow night, you know? And that's the way it started. Elvis played it and the rest is history. Humes was uh, a school uh, where uh, the rich kids didn't go to Humes. They didn't. They didn't. There were the, the kids that were. They weren't poor, but they weren't rich. Sort of medium class kids. Elvis did fair. He was a fair student. He was like a B and C student. Uh, he did fair. You know, he wasn't outstanding, but by any means, he wasn't a bad student. The early music that Elvis was exposed to was gospel music. That was the first uh, from the church. And then the second, I think, was uh, country music. Then the third was rhythm and blues. And actually, that was the secret to Elvis' success because he combined gospel music with country music with rhythm and blues, and in his own style, it came out rock and roll. Early on in his career, he liked singers like the country singers like Marty Robbins and Hank Snow and Eddie Arnold. Uh, some of the gospel groups he loved were the Blackwood Brothers and the Statesmen. Uh, early black singers he liked. One of his favorites was a singer named Roy Hamilton, who died several years ago. He liked Jackie Wilson. He liked Clyde McFadder. Uh, he liked the guys with the big voices or the high voices. He liked Tony Williams and the Platters. He liked the Drifters. He liked the Clovers. Uh, he liked uh, Bo Diddley, Chuck Berry. He liked a lot of those early uh, guys. Uh, there was a shop on Beale Street called Lansky Brothers, and uh, quite often he would frequent this shop. And uh, they had, uh, at that time, pretty outlandish clothing. And he liked the flashy style of clothes. And that shop sold a lot of clothes to entertainers at that time. So consequently, he would frequent uh, the, the shop to buy clothes. In high school, uh, a lot of the kids uh, would, would uh, 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 tease Elvis. They would kid him about his hair or his clothes. I think. 
that I was the only black that was playing Elvis. And the, uh... but I think prior to that, there was a fella here who had a program who, who just happened to be white. His name was Dewey Phillips. He had an outlet on radio station WHBQ. The program was called Red, Hot, and Blue. And uh, Phillips, Dewey Phillips provided rhythm and blues, black music. He gave it an injection like it had never been done before. Because uh, that was really, uh, before DIA, there was no outlet for black music. And Dewey, when Dewey started to play rhythm and blues, it took off like a late freight and never looked back. But uh, I was the only one that, was, I feel like I was the only one that was playing Elvis because I liked his music. And I said, why are you, why are you playing the white boy's music? But there was something about Elvis that really uh, got a hold of me in a sense where being a white boy and being influenced by black music. And he did it well. He didn't sound like a black, but with what he did to uh, black music, his version of rhythm and blues, he did a very good version of it. And Elvis doing his version of black music really gave it an, another injection like it had never been before. The program director, who just happened to be white, stopped me from playing it because he felt like that blacks didn't like Elvis's music. And when, when Elvis started, that was Roy Brown, uh, Winona Harris, and, uh, and since he was getting into it, and since Sam Phillips of Sun Records was looking for a white boy who could sing black, then uh, he dropped all the blacks that was in his stable at that time that was connected with the studio. Uh, he got uh, Elvis, Roy Alderson, Johnny Cash, Carl Perkins, and uh, Cherry Lee Lewis. All of those were there, and uh, all of them were doing basically black music. At one period, they said only, it was said that only uh, black folk had the blues. Wrong. Blues has no color. Very, very few artists um, do things that really excite me, you know, that I really want to really just make me jump up out of my seat, you know. But it was new, and it was different, and it was new for this part of the country. A white boy singing the blues. And it, all, all, it had always been, been asked the question, can a white boy sing the blues? Not many. They try. But not many of them actually know how to sing the blues. Several days went by before I could actually play the Elvis Presley record, That's All Right in Blue Moon in Kentucky, because at that time, we really weren't playing uh, so-called rhythm and blues records on WHBQ. In 1954, in Memphis, you had a radio station called WDIA, which played all black music, and they had all black disc jockeys. So if you wanted those kinds of records in great proportion, you would go listen to WDIA. But if you wanted to hear, if you wanted to be, if you were one of the in crowd and you wanted to hear good black music on a white radio station, on a white radio show, quote unquote, you would listen to Dewey Phillips every night from nine to midnight on WHBQ. To the Chiska Hotels, on the mezzanine of the Chiska Hotel where the radio station was located in downtown Memphis, South Main Street. Dewey Phillips did a nighttime show called Red Hot and Blue, wherein he played mostly black music in those days. Only Dewey Phillips could play uh, Elvis's records in the early days for at least a couple of weeks after they first brought it to the station. Uh, we played mostly white music, to be very honest with you. There was, uh, 
as, as I, most people thought Elvis was black at that time. So we played Kay Starr and Eddie Fisher and Joe Stafford, that kind of thing. But uh, a couple of weeks after uh, the Elvis Presley record was first played on Red, Red Hot and Blue, Dewey Phillips' program, then the whole station started playing it because it was like the the, uh, the dam gates broke open and, and this great surge of Elvis uh, mania uh, came along and everybody played Elvis Presley then. Elvis's emergence as a, as a popular star, as a superstar, uh, more than likely served more than any other force to break down the barriers between uh, white music and black music because uh, of the fact that uh, in the beginning most people thought he was black anyway. So if we're going to play his music, why don't we play this black music? The first time I saw Elvis on stage was on the back of a flatbed truck over in Arkansas. I can't remember the exact little town. One of those little, little uh, uh, jerkwater towns, as, as they're called. Uh, calling it a jerkwater town, I'm glad I can't remember the name of the town because I'd probably get a lot of hate mail. But uh, he was absolutely incredible. Uh, you could see, I mean, it's one thing to listen to the records and feel that, that, that magnetism that he conveyed on record, but to see this man in person and to see him doing things, uh, gyrating, whatever you wanted to call it in those days, which you'd never seen before. So occasionally, I would go to some of these small, you know, uh, personal appearances with him, and he enjoyed that because he felt good that one of his buddies was with him, and I enjoyed it because uh, it gave me a thrill to see my high school buddy up on stage entertaining, you know. Amazingly, he was getting tremendous reactions. We did one show here in Memphis behind a drugstore, and Elvis was on a flatbed truck, and I introduced him as he went on stage, and the, pe and the girls just started screaming like crazy, and I couldn't figure it out, you know, we didn't know why, because, but there was just, he had that magic early on in his career. He said, I can't believe this is all real. He said, I think I'm gonna wake up. It's a dream, George. He said, isn't this great? I said, oh, it's fantastic. Let's not worry about it. Let's enjoy it, you know. And he said, oh, I'm enjoying it all right. He said, but I can't believe it's happening to me. I was on the air doing an afternoon radio show in Memphis, and out of the blue, here comes Elvis. He pops in just to visit, and he stayed in the, in the control room with me for about a half an hour. We did an interview. Uh, we had kids who, kids at that time could come down and watch the radio show. So we had a studio of about 50 or 60 kids, and they just went crazy when he walked in. And they, he, he signed autographs and took pictures with them and all that. It was a real exciting day. Television came, and the television crew came in and covered it, and, uh, uh, and I got a kick out of him being there people would come up to Elvis and they would say, uh, you know, Elvis, uh, I, I don't know if I'd want to be in your shoes. You, you know, you live in a, in a, in a glass uh, fishbowl. You can't even walk down the street by yourself. And Elvis would say, who in the heck wants to walk down the street? I want to drive down at my Rolls Royce. The second time I saw him was at the uh, Russwood Park, the old home of the Memphis Chicks, a baseball team in Memphis. And the whole park was just bursting at the seams with uh, not only people from Memphis, but people all over the Mid-South. Uh, you had to fight to get a ticket, and it was just absolutely an incredible experience and something that, well, you knew you were becoming, you were a part of something that was really special in those early days. You didn't know how long it would last. Who, who knew it would last as long as it did? But you knew you were part of, of something that was going to be something that would, would go down in musical history, and indeed, uh, that's the way it turned out. I remember one particular visit to Elvis's home, his first home that he bought with money that he made from his records and personal appearances out on Audubon Drive in Memphis. It was sort of a uh, Western ranch type looking home, uh, which he probably paid forty or fifty thousand dollars for in those days. Very expensive for its type in that in that day and, and, and time. And uh, early on, you could go out to Elvis's house and just sit around, sort of as we say today, hang out. That later ended within the next oh, year or so after 1956 because the colonel stopped it and uh, Elvis had so many uh, people around him that, you know, they, they were protecting him at that time and you couldn't, you couldn't get close to him. I remember we were sitting in the kitchen around the kitchen table such as this and just drinking coffee and talking and, about Elvis's uh, success and milling around outside were just kids taking pieces of, uh, of sod, grass, out of the front yard as mementos. And this was early on. Uh, and cars constantly up and down this section of Audubon Drive where Elvis lived. And it upset the neighbors no end. There were several stories in the Memphis paper at that time about what is going on here. You know, we, we had a quiet neighborhood and all of a sudden Elvis Presley moves in. Who is this guy who's bringing all these people in? It became quite a, 
it became quite a, uh, a sore subject and a source of irritation for his neighbors in 1955-56. Elvis uh, worked uh, several jobs. Uh, uh, one was an all-night factory, but his mom made him quit because it was affecting his schooling. And then uh, he worked as an usher at a movie theater. And the ironic part was the, the manager of the theater fired Elvis. The girl behind the candy counter in the lobby was slipping Elvis popcorn and candy, and one of the other ushers uh, told the manager. And so uh, Elvis and him got in a fight over that, and Elvis got fired. And then his first motion picture was world premiered at that very same theater. It was really nice. Elvis told a funny story when he first uh, got famous like that. His mom, Gladys, was still economical, and she would still buy the small tubes of toothpaste, the little bitty ones. And Elvis told her, he said, Mom, I can buy the whole drugstore. He said, don't worry about it. Buy anything you want. And then uh, he bought her a mixer, a uh, uh, thing that you put food in and mix up, you know, a blender. And she had a one on one side of the room, and it was a big kitchen. So he, she was walking over there and back and forth. So he went out and bought another mixer and put it on the other side of the room so she wouldn't. He said, look, I'll have you two mixers, so you don't have to keep walking back and forth. They just loved every minute of it because it was, it was a, the American dream come true. Here's their son who becomes a big star, becomes extremely wealthy, takes them from the housing projects to a big, beautiful home and with Cadillacs and, and cooks and waiters and everything. So I had Crown Electric Company up at 333 Poplar, and uh, it was a contracting business uh, uh, where you went out and did contracting on schools, churches, and that kind of stuff. We didn't do too much residential, but we did more commercial. And uh, uh, Elvis he was uh, driving a truck for delivering the material out on the job where the electricians was working. Just from the beginning of the, of, I don't know, it was seemed like it was a different voice or different type of music. And uh, uh, that's another reason I, I really enjoyed it, is the reason that, uh, and I think everybody else did, because that's the reason we all went. If we didn't enjoy it, we wouldn't have, because uh, we didn't know that he was gonna turn out to be uh, uh, star like he was so now uh, when we went to the uh, uh, Bon Air and Clearpool and different places we used to follow him around uh, when he'd make these nightclubs and play you know and uh, Dewey Phillips uh, was a disc jockey and he he never did let him do too much of it he let him come out two or three times and and uh, I think that's one of the things that really helped him. He didn't wear the people out with his uh, music to start with, but they just get up and gather around, the, or just gather around and get up on the table and get around the uh, stage. And and out at uh, Clearpool, uh, everybody get up and go around. And he'd uh, he'd be shaking that leg and playing that guitar, and he'd look over at me, you know, and and uh, I'd wink at him. Man, he just tear that thing up because he. He thought that was great that his boss was, uh, you know, there with him on that and that. And we did give him a lot of support. We had uh, the construction people, Jameson Construction Company, and we did a lot of work for them, and they were our personal friends. And so uh, the, we'd take all of the, the carpenters and electricians and us and Mr. Jameson and Ms. Jameson, all of us follow him around on all these places here in Memphis. I would, I'm, I'm not one that would try to have kept him because uh, I knew that he was doing good because he had made two or three records, about three, I think it was, and and he'd done bought his Cadillac, and so he was, I could see that, you know, that he was gonna go places, and uh, I didn't uh, insist on him. I just told him that, uh, well, I understand that, you know, that you're playing all these places at night and you can't work, and stay out all night too and so uh, like I say I hate to let him go but uh, I, I've always been one that uh, if somebody can benefit yourself and do the make more for themselves uh, in another way why well, I, I don't ever ask them to stay he uh, he always said yes sir and yes ma'am no matter who he was talking to he called me I was about the same age as Elvis he called me Mr. Martindale and I remember saying to him one time, uh, Elvis, you don't have to call me, Mr. Martin. Just call me Wink. 
And uh, early on, he called me Winky, because a lot of people call me Winky. I did an interview with Elvis on my teenage dance party, and that was one of the few that's ever been recorded, uh, interview with Elvis Presley. And uh, when the colonel found out about it, he was most upset. It almost happened by accident in that uh, somebody suggested, it was before videotape, somebody suggested that we set up a camera and record the interview. And uh, we did it, and it's turned out to be one of the few uh, early interviews on film with Elvis. How about the big uh, show at Rustwood Park scheduled for July 4th? Bob Johnson, surely I know, wants us to mention that, and we want to mention it. I believe the proceeds from this show go to the Cynthia Milk Fund. Is that right, Elvis? Yes, sir, that's right. And uh, uh, I'd like to say uh, that... Uh, uh, let's see, what would I like to say? Uh, I'd, I'd like to say that we have a, a diamond ring that we're going to uh, have as a door prize. Uh -huh. uh, it's my initial ring. I've had it for some time, and it has 14 diamonds in it. And uh, we're going to give it away at the door as a door prize. I see. And uh, everything. And all the all the proceeds from this particular show. This is July 4th at Rustwood Park. Elvis is going to be there. He's going to sing and play. His band will be there. Many other stars will be there too. And we will certainly want you to watch Bob Johnson's column in the Memphis Press Cemetery. Watch all the publicity on it, and get your tickets in advance. Elvis Presley. I want to thank you again because thank we know you you're a busy man and thanks a lot for coming by and seeing us at dance party and saying hello to all your friends here in Memphis and the Mid-South. Anytime you're in town and want to come by, we certainly will welcome you. Well, thank you very much, Wink, and I'll see you again. Okay, thanks a lot. Those are the things that stand out in my mind, the mannerly way in which he carried himself. And it always impressed everybody. When he came to Hollywood and started making films, I'm sure you've heard this before. It was always Mr. This, uh, Miss That, or Mrs. That. He's just a very mannerly human being. He was nice and, and good, and he gave to people. He was uh, turned out to be a philanthropist later in his life. He gave, and most of what he gave, people never really knew about because he would make a big deal about it. The cars, that sort of thing, to the people around him, that's, that's legend, but uh, the things he did for people that all of us, most of us, uh, never heard about are the things that, that really are special and should be brought out mm -hmm. today. Elvis uh, quite often talked about the life he had in Tupelo, but he didn't want to think too much about it. Uh, pe people would say, Elvis, uh, you remember back in Tupelo? And he said, heck no, I don't want to forget about that. It was, it was too rough. It was too hard, and uh, they were poor, and it was too uh, sad. So he didn't really reflect too much upon his life in Tupelo. I used him as a popular performer with the sides of the records, um, Good Rockin' Tonight, uh, Milk Cow Blues, uh, I Forgot to Remember to Forget, Junior Parker's Tune, the, the early Elvis Presley things. Uh, uh, that were very exciting records, very interesting, small group records, no drums on them, but it was an exciting thumping bass uh, guitar kind of sound that was rather unique. And a couple of those records were good dance records, but they weren't significant sales records because they didn't distribute them. Phillips had no, Sam Phillips, who owned the Sun label, used that label generally as a label to generate interest, and then he would peddle the artist to some larger company or something, and he would make a quick profit. He was in that way a creative person, but a peddler. And um, he did that with Presley. The distribution was terrible. When Presley first came into Cleveland, for example, they would bring in in the back of their Cadillac. They had a pink and uh, multicolored Cadillac. And they'd have a car trunk full of records that they would pedal in between the shows, right out of the back of the trunk, and take the money. Scotty and Bill used to do that. And Presley would sign the, the records. So there was no distribution, but there was a lot of interest in him. Scotty, of course, Scotty Moore, was the earliest member of that particular group to have a paper contract with Elvis Presley. But, uh, and he was maneuvered out of that by Colonel Parker later on. And that was probably a tragic move for Presley. I think if he'd been able to stay with Scotty as a leveling force and kept to his roots uh, and Bill Black, he might have had some way to counteract the sycophantic kind of things that happened to him as a person later on with all the hanger-ons and the people that attended to prostitute themselves around him and, and uh, in a way, I think, helped uh, him destroy himself. They had a union contract where Bill Black, Elvis Presley, and Scotty Moore were a three-part cooperative band managed by Scotty Moore because the union required that someone run the business, pay the taxes, pay the dues. Musicians are 
relatively uh, delinquent in those areas. So Scotty ran the business. We dealt directly with Scotty Moore, not with Elvis Presley. He made sure he was on time. Presley had a very bad time sense. Uh, he made sure that the instruments were there, that the job was done, that taking care of business uh, cliche was really Scotty Moore's way of taking care of business. He took care of Elvis Presley's early business. And he was the titular person on that contract, the original contract. Neil had some kind of a paper, but it wasn't legal because Elvis Presley was underage. Keep in mind that I was working at the desk and I was only personally familiar with what happened there in the studio within my hearing. So I'm not quite sure what happened, but I do know that Elvis began to sing with a country band that had tried to get a, some recordings with Sun and later did get one record. And I, it's my recollection that he met Scotty and perhaps Bill while he was doing those one night stands at various nightclubs around town. And whether it was Sam's, I think it was the Sam's suggestion or request to Scotty that they work with Elvis and prepare something to come in. Well, they undoubtedly did work a lot and they came in, they all had jobs, you know, but they came in when they could and the studio was always available to all the artists at, at any time, no charge, day or night. Sam was always there, I was always there. Uh, but, uh, so they came and came. The question about, for example, the first song, was it rehearsed, was it done, did it just happen out of the blue? It's quite probable that they had run through it a, a couple of times when they were just jamming around. But it, in fact, it did happen after a long, one of those long, tedious sessions on and on into the night. Those sessions that my son recalls so delightfully because of Bill's antics, mainly in the way they played to each other. And there did come a point when they began to play That's All Right, Mama, and Sam said, okay, that's it, we'll go with that, that's right. And then, of course, there was, after we had, Sam felt instantly, we've got it, we've, this is it, we've got a hit, this is it. And uh, then there was a problem of what to do with the other side, and then they decided to do Blue Moon of Kentucky. So, in a sense, it was something maybe they had played around with, but it actually happened there in the studio. I picked up the phone, called Scotty Moore and Bill Black. They were playing in a country band here. I was very interested in Scotty Moore, uh, especially Bill, also Bill Black, the bass player. But I knew Scotty was open uh, for suggestions on uh, the approach that we wanted to try to make. He liked to do things that Chad Atkins did, but I knew that wasn't for us, you know. It's very hard to, to say whether Sam recognized instantly what the, Elvis's potential was, uh, because he was so very preoccupied with business details and keeping afloat and trying to get ahead. I think it's quite possible that he may not really have listened to those first two personal demos or listened to Elvis very intently. And I think perhaps the first time he really listened to him was on the afternoon that we spent with just running through every, uh, snatches of this and that and getting acquainted more or less. Uh, but I think that from that moment on, he, Sam felt that he had something very special and that he, what he had to do was to find the right sound, the right vehicle and the right moment. Now that was what was so terribly difficult and where Sam's infinite patience came in was the, and the willingness of, of Scotty and Bill to just come in and work and work and work again. Because Elvis was the only Sun artist who did not have his own material. All the other artists who came in, Johnny Cash, Roy Orbison, all of them had scads of their own material. Or in case they didn't have a song that sounded like some other artists had it, but it was all new material. And Elvis uh, didn't write songs, and we couldn't find one that seemed right for him. Although he had a marvelous ear, you could just sing it once or go through it once, and he knew the song and knew what to do with it. Um, so it was a matter of weeding out and listening, and, and I, I'm very sure that just as has been shown in some movie <laughs> recreations, it was a case of Eureka, what are you doing there? That's it, I, I want that. Which just broke them up because 
The same thing happened so often with the black artists. Sam would pretend he wasn't listening to put them at ease because they were trying to play what they thought he, as a white man, wanted to hear. And he wanted to hear what he was used to hearing growing up and listening to the music on the back steps and in the old cafes and everything. So when they thought he wasn't listening, then they would start doing this with their odd little instruments. And then I remember one time Sam came back and said, now that's what I want, why are we wasted all this time? That's what I want. And I remember one of the black artists saying, oh, Mr. Phillips, you don't want that, that's trash music. <laughs> so <laughs> it was almost the same with that's all right. Mama, they, they couldn't believe that they'd been looking around for something that was something they, they had fun with. But um, I think Sam definitely knew that this was it and we got the other side and in fact he mastered it immediately and rushed down to Dewey Phillips to put it on the air and the rest is history. <laughs> it wasn't that we didn't have some takes that possibly we could have done something with, but they didn't have, they didn't have that contagious type of ability to grab you. Well, we had tried many different things. This is another example of what we referred to back uh, about Elvis, like myself, having heard uh, practically every artist in the nation at one time or the other, and in your mind. The thing that we did more than anything else, we would not draw lines on music. This is pop, this is country, this is bluegrass, this is hillbilly, this is... Uh, rhythm and blues or race music. I mean, we drew, you had the, they drew the lines. People did. We didn't. I didn't. In those days, the music business was kind of centered around WSM radio station, which was down at 7th and Union, and the Clarkston Hotel, which was next door. The writers and artists would gather in the Clarkston coffee shop and drink coffee, and we'd get to see the pretty girls and talk about the music business at the same time. A writer by the name of Vic McAlpin said, Hey, Chet, I want you to hear this. And he played it, played this record for me of, uh, I guess it was Blue Moon of Kentucky. I believe that's what it was. And I said, Who in the heck is that? And he said, Do you think he's black or white? And I said, Well, he sounds black at times, and he sounds bluegrass. I don't know what he is. What's his name? And he said, Elvis Presley. And I thought, That's the worst name I've ever <laughs> I thought that's the worst name I've ever heard. He got booked on a tour with uh, Hank Snow because uh, Colonel Parker managed Hank Snow, and they had a they had a company called Jamboree Attractions. And so he went out on tour with Hank Snow. Elvis did. He and Scotty and Bill, and got to hear and word back that this guy Elvis Presley, you couldn't get him off the stage with a fire hose. The girls loved him. He would shake his hips instead of patting his foot. He shook his hip and his leg. He appeared on the Grand Ole Opry and, uh, and went over pretty good, I thought. But I heard him one night in the studio, he told us, yeah, I said, I played on the Grand Ole Opry. He was talking on the mic and we were in the control room. Mr. Denny says, we don't like that nigger music around here. Go back to Memphis and drive a truck. And uh, it's the first I ever knew that. I knew Mr. Denny, who ran the Grand Ole Opry, and I was very surprised that he uh, that he treated Elvis that way. He was very much miffed when he saw uh, Bill and Scotty with their broken up instruments. Bill's bass was really, truly held together with bailing wire, and it was a very sad looking instrument. And I remember his saying, I wanted the whole band. I want the band just like it was on the record. And Sam said, this is the band, this is it, just like it was on the record. We went on to this place, and, we, and Elvis said he'd wait outside because his, he didn't think his mama wanted him in a nightclub place like that. So we didn't stay very long, and we went back to the hotel, and um, the next morning, as I say, we all drove back to Memphis. I've never understood the, the passages that were included in the initial Elvis book, um, where he says that Elvis cried all the way home from Nashville. And I called Jerry Hopkins and said, where did you get that piece of information? And he said, one of the Jordanaires told me. I said, well, the Jordanaires didn't even meet Elvis until some years later. The Grand Ole Opry, you've heard many times that, uh, and saw it in a movie where Jim Denny, who was the chief of the Artist Service Bureau at the Grand Ole Opry, told Elvis to go back and drive a truck. That is not true. That is not true. I booked him on, I was right there, 
in person, and as a matter of fact, he was very pleased with Elvis. It was a very difficult to, to get Elvis on the Grand Ole Opry in the first place. Once he was there, they still didn't know for sure what the reaction was going to be across the country. But the audience reaction, he went on at 10, between 10.15 and 10.30 with uh, Hank Snow, who was uh, an established uh, uh, Grand Ole Opry artist at the time. And each artist that had a 15-minute program on, during uh, the, the, the different segments of the Grand Ole Opry would have a guest artist frequently. Elvis happened to be the guest artist with Hank Snow. And lo and behold, uh, when he started to introduce Elvis, bless heart, uh, Hank's heart, he's a great guy, Hank Snow, he's a good old Canadian. We love him to death, and Elvis loved him too, the big eight-wheeler rolling down the line, Elvis used to sing that. And uh, he forgot Elvis's name. There were three persons in that car coming home from Nashville. Sam was driving, I was in the front seat, and Elvis was in the back seat. And if he was crying, and if he was that upset, I was not aware of it. That Ryman Auditorium was a pretty shabby place. I mean, it was unique and it was it was interesting. But, and I remember him turning to me and saying, "You mean this is what I've been dreaming of all my life?" And it was so poignant. And it was like so many of the things that we look forward to in our lives. And this is it, kid. This is it. This is all there is to it. So I don't know anything about any deals or any potential to be on the Grand Ole Opry. I think, of course, it would have been the kiss of death for his career. But if he had expected a contract that didn't develop, um, I don't know anything about that. And he shouldn't have had one anyway. He didn't belong singing on the Grand Ole Opry. Marion Kaiska gave few interviews and this was the very last time she agreed to be filmed. Her contribution to Elvis's story was always undervalued, but without her, his career might well not have commenced. Sadly, she died on the 29th of December, 1989, at the age of 72, in the Methodist Hospital in Memphis, the same hospital that Gladys Presley died in.